All right, we are uh, going to be on the downhill here, and we're going to wrap up our Extra Elephant series tonight by finishing up our conversation that we started last week about the binary elephant. We didn't cover it all, so we're going to do that. But also, we finished up the series on Sunday morning this past week with the impossible elephant. Um, and so if you were uh, with us, um, you heard me share with you um, a formula, if you will, that I shared originally with our staff. I shared it with our board. It is a, uh, something that the more I've messed with it, uh, I tend to see just a whole lot of things and ways that this really does work in the operating system of our lives much more than we think it does if we're followers. Um, I used the illustration of Noah building the ark, and I said when things are in front of you and they seem impossible, they're so big that you don't know how you're going to get there from here. They're the things you haven't tackled yet, um, but they're there. And if God's got a hand in that and you begin working on it, then all of a sudden that impossible task, while it is still tough, begins to become improbable. In other words, you see a way it can be done, you just don't know how it's going to happen yet. And you continue to work at it, and you continue to work at it, and you continue to be obedient, you continue to do your homework, and you continue to put all those pieces together, and all of a sudden the improbable begins to kick, and you realize before you know it that the improbable has now become inevitable. In other words, you have the plan now. You're rolling toward it, and you're confident that this is exactly what you're supposed to do. That happens in so many areas of our life, big things, little things. When David walks out to face Goliath, right? I mean, if you're sitting there and you're watching it, you're watching it from the side like that, it's absolutely an impossible matchup. It's impossible. There's no way that a little teenage boy is going to beat Goliath on the battlefield. But the more you hear David talk, and the more you hear his line of thinking, you begin to realize what it took to get him out on that field in front of that giant where no one else would go out there, that he could not stand the fact that this guy was out there insulting God, and that he was confident because he knew that he had already killed the lion, he had already killed the bear. Surely Goliath couldn't be tougher than that. He's a kid. He doesn't know better. And all of a sudden, the improbable begins to take place, and then he calls the shot. He takes five stones. Because Goliath's got four brothers. He's going to use one stone, but he tells Goliath before he throws the stone the most amazing thing. One of the most amazing moments in all the scripture. And sometimes we read past it so quick, he says, I'm going to cut your head off. And he's standing there with a slingshot. But David calls the shot and he looks at Goliath and says, I'm going to cut your head off. And go back and read the story. Read, do the deep dive. He makes the call, but he doesn't have a sword. So it begs the question, where is he going to get the sword? Well, I know he's going to take the Goliath's sword. So all of a sudden, this improbable, impossible, improbable conversation turns into the inevitable, and here's this teenage kid with one rock hitting Goliath in the one spot that was going to put him down. It doesn't kill him. What kills him, he runs over and cuts his head off. It's crazy, right? Think of your life and how many times Something that seems big. And it doesn't have to be uh, giant killing. It can be something simple. I, I was having this conversation today with my publicist, and we're working on a book deal. And you can pray for me on that, too, because we're, we're, my publisher's going out of business. <laughs> and so for the first time in 13 years, I'm having to dance with, a, with a, a new publishing house, and we're negotiating, and we can't get the contract worked out right, and... and um, what they want and what my demands are seem to be a, a long way away right now. And so, uh, and I'm being a little bit more of a pain, I'm sure, than they want me to be. Uh, but, you know, this would be my sixth novel. And so, you know, we've, we've, we've sold a bunch of books. And so it, it, it's, we're going to have to get the deal worked out. Or we'll just go somewhere else. And so we're working on it. And so we, we, we're, we've got an offer that's going on the table with them tomorrow. And so you can pray that maybe it'll go through. Um, you know, but I can tell you in 2010... When I um, said I was going to write a book, I discovered something that it's one thing to say you're going to write a book. And then it's another thing to tell somebody you're going to write a book and have them buy into your idea and ask you, well, how much of the book you have done? Oh, I got a lot of it done, which was a lie. I lied. I had a chapter and a half done. How quick can we get it? Oh, three months. It was a lie. They got it a year later. Um, because I found out right after I had signed the contract 
that I was going to write a book. If I didn't know how to write a book. Hey, Scott. Okay. It's impossible. Hey, Kelly. Wow. They got to let you guys out? Man, when you're late, oh, come on in. <laughs> let me change my notes now. I got to change what I was going to say. Scott and Kelly are here now. All right. So, 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 so again, in a smaller scale, that was an impossible task. Because, I mean, I, I don't know how to do that. I didn't know how to do it. Um, so I did the most amazing thing. I started. <laughs> I just started. Uh, people want to know now, oh, tell us about your method. There's no method. Do you know how it's going to end? Nope. Don't know how it's going to end when I start. You know what you're going to say? Nope. You know what the character's going to do? Not until I get to it. I mean, I write it in real time. So in the new book I'm working on, I can tell you exactly what happens up to chapter 28. I have no idea what's going to happen in chapter 29. That's why I haven't written it yet. <laughs> um, but all of a sudden, though, somewhere in the midst of it, it became very improbable, but it dawned on me, you know what? I'm going to get this thing done. I'm going to get this thing done. The end game was just to get a book done and get it published. Whether anybody read it or not was absolutely secondary to me, did not matter. I wanted to get it done. I wanted to say I did it. I wanted to go to the next thing. Um, and it happened, and so the inevitable began. I mean, all of a sudden, this impossible task became inevitable. And it came together, and lo and behold, I wrote a book a couple of times now. Um, still don't know what I'm doing. Still no smarter at it. Still don't know why it works the way it works. Still don't know all the details about it. And now I'm finding out again I know very little about publishing as I'm negotiating with a new publisher. But we're going to get it done. I mean, I'm confident that, that we're going to get it done. And, and for this scenario, I'm not really doing a whole lot of negotiating. I have somebody that gets to do that for me. And so they're, they're, they're doing a good job. But in our life, that's the way things work. And so for us as followers, the key to it all is making sure that God's got his hand in the impossible. And if God's got his hand in the impossible, you've got to know. Your job then is to roll up your sleeves and do the work. And when you start doing the work, all of a sudden that impossible becomes a lot more improbable. You won't even be able to see the end of it from where you're at. You, don't, you might not even know how it's going to end. But eventually that will then become inevitable and you know that somehow God's going to take and use what you're doing to do something amazing. And so for you, for me, for all of us, I mean, we face the impossible every day of our lives in some big or small way. Scenarios where you think, I just can't do this. I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to survive it. Um, it could be a job. It could be parenting. It could be something financial. It, it could be anything. And yes, all of those things out there seem impossible, but what you're always looking for in that impossible moment, does God have his hand in it? And that's where you have to start. You have to answer that question. God, is this something we're supposed to dance with? Do you have a hand in it? And if the answer is yes, then it's your job then to start moving it and see what you can do to start developing the systems, the plan, scenarios, Something to get it from the impossible to the improbable. Most people, by the way, are loaded with impossible and they never do anything with it. That's why most people die with untapped potential and unlimited possibilities. And a lot of people never do the work that they need to do to take that impossible because what we want is we want God to move it from the impossible to done. We don't, want to see, we don't want the improbable peace. We don't want the inevitable peace because that's what all the work is, right? So we just want God to do the impossible and just finish it up for us and let us just walk into it. He can, by the way. He's God. All right? I mean, he can. not not going to limit God. But I will tell you by personal testimony, I have discovered, and the biblical pattern tends to be that you've got to do some work to get there. There's some obedience involved. There's some stuff that's got to happen. You, you know, God's going to bless it and he's going he's to honor it, but you got to do something. And it's usually not what you think you're going to have to do. And it usually doesn't work out the way you think it's going to work out. I think part of the adventure is understanding that um, God really is at work in the impossible as well. 
Because for you to see the impossible, for you to understand the impossible, for you to start getting your head and heart around it, to get excited about the impossible, I think really is a work of God. And that's what makes the journey fun. Um, and it's what makes the journey big. Some things are obviously bigger than others. You know, um, as I've said, we've talked about Christmas dreams um, a few minutes ago and we were sharing some stuff there. I, I think I've made the statement once, but I've made it a thousand times. You know, some dreams just take longer. You, know, you, get, you get impatient when it doesn't happen fast, but some dreams just take more time. And nothing wrong with that. Uh, probably, <laughs> I'm trying to remember when it happens, probably somewhere as we move in through the summer months, we're going to talk about dream chasing and what that looks like. I think it's maybe June. Don't hold me to that. Anyway, um, but we're, so we're going to talk about that. So if you're a dreamer and you don't know it, or you're a dreamer and you can't figure out how to chase it, uh, we're going to work on that a little bit. All right? Now, questions about that Sunday? Questions left over from last week's binary elephant conversation? <laughs> either on Sunday or Wednesday, either one. It's a good time to ask. Um, actually, ask away. More of a statement, but I'll keep it short. Okay. Um, I wanted to share it last week, but I was new, so I was shy. But um, <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I the first time I saw a trans person, I was watching America's Next Top Model, Tyra Banks, huge fan. So I watched her show um, whenever I was sick, and it, it was like season five or six, and it was the first time I had heard, I had seen it, I had heard the explanation, and I was like confused by it because I just didn't understand it. And then I watched the whole season. Um, he didn't win. But um, at the end, like, my mom was like, what is that? And I was like, oh, like, so, so I started explaining it, you know, what, what the TV fed me, I guess, and I'm feeding her what, like, I was fed, and she looks at me, and she goes, so, like, do you believe in God? And I thought it was, like, a stupid question. I'm like, yeah. She's like, okay, do you think he's perfect? Yes. Do you think he put all these tiny pieces that made you, you? Yeah. Okay, so do you think that God makes mistakes? Do you think that he just messed up and he accidentally gave him the wrong part? And I was, and I was like, I didn't have an answer. And I, so obviously I'm like, well, no, <laughs> you know? And then I was like 12 or 13, and then that was kind of the end of that. But it stems because I believe in God, and I believe in the Bible, and I have that faith, you know? So just that simple question, like, well, do you think God makes mistakes then? It's like, well... Yeah. And then that was that. So sure. I don't know. I just thought that, I don't know. I, thought, I feel like sometimes, like, we can answer the question with another question sometimes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, and Amy made a point last week, and we talked a little bit after it was over with, too, where, you know, I mean, we, we, are, we are moving through a generation of people that's, that's an interesting generation. Because, again, as I shared with you, you know, last week, I mean, you, you know, you do you kind of blow through life and, you know, you think back on your life experiences, you don't think anything about it. I shared with you the story about the boy who's gone home and he's questioning his sexuality because someone at school told him he's gay. I mean, I don't know whether he's gay or not. Um, uh, and then, but a lot of that, a lot of heavy lifting that I grew up in an environment where that heavy lifting was done in the home. In the home. You know, I, had, I had mom and dad that, that, that would do that heavy lifting with me. You know, I mean, we were joking about it a little bit later on, but I mean, I, I, I knew Tommy's dad uh, when he was alive, and we were making a joke about the fact, what, what would your dad say if you ran in there and said that one day? And, you know, Rafer, Rafer would knock Tommy back in the yard and said, what? What are you talking about? You know, I mean, it's just, you know. But again, that knock would have clarified it. Yeah, you would have known right away who you are, yeah. I mean, but, but, but a lot of the lifting today is not being done by parents. And, and... And the other thing about it is too, it is a gener it's a generational thing though, because again, we're this is not this is now an era where the conversations are different. It's not a conversation that happened ten years ago. And so you've got you got now uh, parents who are moving through um, a, a, an era where we have untethered in so many ways from some of those foundational things that I held on to when I was a kid. Um, they're trying to move and navigate life. We're hearing from the culture all around us. We're hearing from, I mean, it is just a tough, tough time. And yet here we are trying to speak into this world. Again, I appreciate some of you sending me some notes um, saying, add a boy. 
um, as we've covered it, because you, you, you figured out that I was already getting some mail that's pretty interesting, and I'm still getting it, which is nice. I uh, really appreciate those cards and letters. Keep them coming. Um, <laughs> but it also, I will tell you, it is, it also it is heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking. So tonight, I, I'm gonna, we're going to cover a lot. Ah, we'll be okay. Um, let me cover some stuff for you. And again, as I said, this is, the, this is the adult version of what we could not cover in family worship on Sunday. Right? We, yeah. Yes, thank you. Huh? What's that? Thank you. Yeah, no, because, because again, I mean, this is one of those kind of things where, you know, I, 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 uh, I know if you've got um, kids in the house like I do, I mean, you know, question, questions come. There are questions, and there are real questions. Some of you may not have kids in the house. Maybe you've got grandkids are going to ask questions. Some of you don't have kids at all, and you're glad because you don't want to answer these questions. I got that. Man, I, am, I completely understand that. Um, but let me, let me give you um, some terms that you hear a lot on the news, that your kids are hearing a lot, that people are hearing about. And I'm going to tell you, and I, I made this disclaimer last week, you know, I, I'm just a lowly pastor. Okay, My job is just I, I read the Bible. I give you a report once a week. Or if you're here twice, I'll give it to you twice, okay? And it's never the same at 9, 11, 15. But I do my best. Um, man, that's what I do for a living, man. So, I mean, I, so I'm not a, I'm not a, uh, this is not my world. I did get the, my, that book from that guy up at the, at the seminary that said he was going to send it to me. I, as promised, I haven't read it. <laughs> it's on the list somewhere. I'll get to it eventually. Um, but let me kind of throw some terms um, that may help. Understanding that these may be dated as soon as I give them to you, all right? Because they do change quite quick. They're quack, quick. They're fluid. <laughs> um, gender. We know what gender means, right? Um, while it's always been used as a synonym, synonym for one's biological sex, uh, the term has been hijacked by gender theorists. As a matter of fact, um, there are over um, 91 options now provided, I believe. Um, of choices that you can choose. Um, and then, as I told you last week, I think if you don't identify with one of the pre-populated lists of gender identities, you can choose and make up your own, fill in your gap. So that's why it's so fluid, right? You, you can actually dictate what your own gender is going to be, okay? At least in the conversations today. Gender dysphoria is the feeling um, that one's emotional and psychological identity doesn't match the biological sex someone was born with. This is where you hear someone say, well, I was, I was, um, I'm trapped in the wrong body. Okay, so that's where that framing comes. That's dysphoria. Gender identity is a common phrase and has to do with one's sense of who they feel themselves to be. Um, now, so if being human is to be male or female, then you need to remember, I would say to you, um, your sex is your gender and your gender is your sex. However, gender identity is a lot more based on feeling. This is what I feel that I am. So this is how I will identify. It completely ignores the DNA of every, nearly every cell in your body, but that is the phrasing of the day. And Understand that culturally, if you disagree with that, if you push back with that, if you dare say to someone who is explaining that to you, then you basically are just a hater, you're a bigot, and you're a religious nut. And as I look around the room, some of you are nuts, but that has nothing to do with religion. All right, um, gender expression. I is, don't have to. Huh? <laughs> I didn't say anybody. I just, uh, gender expression is commonly used to refer to how someone presents themselves to others as male, female, some combination of the two, or neither. Um, it could include language, uh, clothing, actions, and more. Um, again, it's fluid. It's based entirely on how you feel on any given day. The idea is, if I say I am, that settles it. And so if I want to dress for you as a woman, and I'm feeling like a woman, um, and I'm going to be proud to be a woman, then so be it. I will dress that way, and because I feel it that way, that's my gender expression. The authority is yourself. Because I said it, there's no discussion on it. 
And, and, and when you meet someone who is in that space, you're caught in that moment because it's extremely difficult for any other conversation to take place because, because again, what have they done in that moment? Well, I'm basing my decision on how I feel. I've said it. My feeling really is the trump card I'm going to play. Now, if you're a follower, you understand that if God says it, that settles it. And when God says it, that settles it whether I agree or not. God has never included me in on anything he wanted to do in the universe. You know, when God created the universe, when he created man, woman, separated light, darkness, water, land, I mean, all, I never had any input into that. God didn't need my input. He is not going to ask me for my input. He doesn't let me vote because God doesn't run a democracy. But yet, somehow, uh, and I made the statement a couple weeks ago, the problem is when people start playing God, they don't like it when you remind them that they're not. That's when they get angry. So this is one of those moments where anything you say back may very well be interpreted as the fact that you're just being something mean and nasty and ornery. Um, because gender expression is very accepted in our culture. Um, and it's based on how you feel. So, so if you get up feeling pretty one day, go be pretty. <laughs> Uh, if you feel like you're not, then don't be. Um, but understand that as a follower, you get to rise above that confusion and understand that you build your life on truth. When God says it and when God does it, that is where you stop. You don't even have to like it, by the way. I mean, and that's okay as a follower. You may not like all that God does. I mean, we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't admit that on Sunday morning, but on Wednesday night we can. There's some stuff that God does. I'm like, God, I don't get it. Why? Why's it got to be that way? It's okay. You can be confident. If God did it and God said it, that settles it. And you can debate it until you're blue in the face. You can fight about it. You can chase around the tree. You can run up the tree, down the tree, inside the tree, outside the tree. It doesn't matter. It doesn't change anything. I have never changed anything that God put in place. And neither have you. And you're not going to start. And that's good, by the way. And that includes gender. Okay. Um, transgender is the umbrella term often used to include everyone who feels any dissatisfaction with their current biological sex. It's also what is often used for those who want to cross-dress. Um, transgenderism is often defined as the expression of a feeling that your gender does not correspond to your sex, and so as a result, you, you changed it. Now we, again, uh, transgenderism is a very real problem. We're going to talk about that um, in a few minutes. Um, it is a real struggle. You know people who struggle with this. You know of families who have this struggle going on in their home, with their children, with their loved ones, with your neighbors. And so while it, it's easy to sit back and just go, this is silly, it's only silly until you deal with it in your own house. It's only silly until your child is doing it. It's only silly until you're looking at someone you love and you know that they've made this mistake and this isn't biblical and you have to love them anyway. And you've got to figure out how to do it. It's tough. We're going to talk about that. So while, you know, while we... It's easy to make light of, and it's easy to brush past and say, well, okay, okay let's go on to something else. Um, this is, um, and I'm going to tell you why in just a minute, but this, is, this, this whole, this issue of sexuality is an issue that is not going away in our culture. It's not going to get easier. It's not going to get easier for your kids, your grandkids, your great-grandkids. As we move closer through these end times, whatever these end times are, these are going to be battles that happen and you're going to know people that have to kind of walk through these things and figure out how to teach. If you've got kids, how do they navigate this? I talked to someone earlier this afternoon that said, you know, this is a battle. They're, they're, they're after our children. Yes. Yes. You know, uh, you know Satan wants your kids. Sure. Um, he wants that victory. He wants to win. 
He loves nothing more than to tell them they're not right with God. He's been doing it since the garden, by the way. That's what he told Eve. That's how he sold Eve on the apple or whatever fruit it was. Did God really say that? He just doesn't want you to be as smart as he is. I mean, Satan doesn't have a new, I mean, he doesn't have a new play in the playbook. He just keeps tweaking it. And right now, he's tweaking it very, very well and powerfully in our culture. Um, non-binary refers to someone who doesn't identify as neither male nor female. So if you choose to be non-binary, you're choosing to be neither or. I, I don't even know how that works. <laughs> I, I, uh, although, I will tell you, I know three people who will tell you they identify as non-binary. And I've looked back at all th two of the three and said, I don't get it. Because I look at you and I, I identify you. Um, I'm sure everyone has had to do this, but for work we have to take annual um, training for um, non-workplace violence, um, discrimination, all these things. And you know they, you have to take a test and everything. And one of the things is um, one of the things that I just recently learned is if somebody says tells you what their pronoun is, what they want to be called, and you accidentally call them a she and they don't want to be called a she, they can file discrimination charges against you or a hostile workplace environment. They can go and complain against you. Mm -hmm. And so the only um, only comfort I get out of that is I work remotely from home so I don't have to worry about you know calling my husband the wrong name or something like that. Mm -hmm. But um, I can't imagine people that actually work in an office sure. that you know, you accidentally call someone a she when they want to be an it or a they or whatever. Yeah. Oh, it's, uh, and, and so, and, and you understand that, that as complicated as that is, right? So how easy is it then just not to interact? I'm just not going to call you anything. I mean, is there any more, anything more dehumanizing than to take away our God-given identities because the person wants to be identified as something different. So when I said it's a tool of Satan, I mean, that's exactly what's taking place because I, I'm not, I'm not going to go to HR. I'm not going to get stuck in this battle. I'm not going to offend you. I'm not gonna, I mean, you know, I can't even call you cowboy or cowgirl because I don't know what to call you, right? So I just won't say anything to you. It's easier not to. So we have a now generations of people who are learning just not to interact. Because why? You don't want to screw up. You don't want to lose your job. You don't want to get in trouble. Uh, you don't want to get sent to HR. You don't want to get uh, kicked out of whatever you know, group you're in. Um, so what do we do? It's just better just not, I'm just not, I'm just not going to deal with it. And that's our world. You can even get in trouble if you ask if somebody thinks you're asking too many questions about uh -huh. their weekend, like, oh, how was your weekend? Oh, you're what triggering you them. Yeah, well, because then you're being, like, nosy. Yeah, oh, yeah. And um, if, I, if you're asking her about her weekend, her, but it's too much, I can file a complaint against you because I was there. Yeah. And I made you I, uncomfortable because I was asking too many questions. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's trouble. That's not, huh? I said I'm in trouble. We, uh, yeah, I mean, need questions. we need to talk before you leave. Yeah, you're in trouble. Yeah. Uh, no. <laughs> um, uh, and then transsexuals, of course, um, are people who are biologically normal and healthy men or women who choose to live as members of the opposite sex. And they may or may not be taking some type of hormonal treatment or surgical treatment to alter that. Now, the question is always, does the Bible talk about this? In Isaiah 45, 9, there's a verse that you may not be familiar with. I'm going to read it to you from the New Living Translation because it will just bother you more. <laughs> um, and it says this, What sorrow awaits those who argue with their creator? Does a clay pot argue with its maker? Does the clay dispute the one who shapes it saying, Stop, you're doing it wrong. Now, that's the New Living Translation. It reads a little bit different in New King James. It's going to read a little different in NIV. But it's a nifty little verse to remind you that there is something about this. It just looks back at God saying, God, you did this wrong. Which is where we come back to what I said in worship, though. 
What you do with the first few words in Scripture, in the beginning God created, dictates everything else that's going to happen in your world. That will change the trajectory of your life forever. Um, please also know this, that this is really just a new form of an ancient heresy that is just now raising its head again. You've heard this before. You've heard the word Gnosticism. Gnosticism. This is what's going on today in the transgender movement is Gnosticism. Gnosticism taught that the soul was good, the body was bad. Gnosticism at its heart said the body doesn't matter. You can do whatever you want to do with the body because the soul is the true self. And so, in my soul, if I feel like I want to identify as a woman, that is my true <laughs> self. And so, I therefore will be a woman. That's Gnosticism. See, it, I told you a minute ago, and I say it again, Satan doesn't have a new play in the playbook. This is just an evil play that he's been playing since the very beginning of time, and he's playing the same deck of cards. However, the dumber the culture gets, the more we get disconnected from God, the more we push God out of the marketplace, the more that we move away from Judeo-Christian principles, the easier it is to sell the lie. And Satan is the father of lies, right? So this is a spiritual battle. It is a spiritual battle for a culture, a generation. It is a spiritual battle for the family. It's a spiritual battle for your children, your grandchildren. It is a spiritual battle. And we're in it up to our ears, whether you want to participate or not. And see, that's why it became an elephant in the room. Because the church doesn't want to talk about this. People in the church don't know how to respond to it. So what do we do? We just don't respond. Because we're fearful. We don't want to offend anybody for God. I got news for you. I offend people for God all the time. But they keep coming back. I, I have a list of people that, that I, I think, I, I, they hate my guts. I know they do. I hear from them on a regular basis. I don't, I don't, keep, I don't keep most of the, the, the fan mail that comes in, but I do keep the hate mail. I want to know when those nutballs walked in. I want to know when they're here. I want to know when they're close. <laughs> I want to know who they are. Um, and I always want to be able to go back and say, I, I, I know your name. Um, but, you know, it's, um, but hear me carefully. It is impossible to change sex. It is impossible to change your sex. You can only change your appearance. Okay? Your birth sex cannot be changed, and no amount of surgery is going to take a man and make him a woman or a woman into a man. And here's why. The XX chromosome and the XY chromosome pattern is set at conception. People who undergo sex reassignment procedures do not become the opposite sex. They are just changing their outward appearance. They don't do anything to the inside. End of the story. That will make you very unpopular to share that truth. But that is true. But also, don't make the mistake, because we watch the news, or you might watch the news, I watch the news, don't make the mistake that every transgender identifying person is an angry activist. <laughs> That's not the case. Activists um, are people whose identities are wrapped up in ideology, um, but there are a lot of people out there who really are struggling with this at some level that are just vulnerable, and they're deeply... Um, struggling with a lot of things that are going on. They're personal, they're psychological issues, and they need counseling and love, not scorn and mockery. And we have to walk that fine line. And it takes courage to be able to speak into that world. Um, Jesus told, told us, you know, there's going to be trouble in the world, but take heart. He's overcome the world. And if you're trying to... Um, shape the culture, sometimes people aren't going to like that. And what do you say in the Beatitudes? You're persecuted for me. You'll be blessed. I mean, there, there is a moment where your faith really does have to kind of collide with the world that we live in. We talked about this a lot in that series we did called Last Blood. I mean, I made the statement in the series that, you know, we're, 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 not, we're, we're not saved we're not saved to be put in a spiritual zoo so the rest of the world can look at us and look at the lion in the cage. 
We are saved by God to be the aggressors in the world and to fight for his kingdom. And everybody's got one last fight left in them. And so our lives are, are, are constantly going to have to come up and we're going to face these kind of issues and you're going to hear the debates. You're going to hear, and, and most of the stuff you hear is junk. And so let me give you five essential things for Christians to keep, us, keep in mind as we speak about transgenderism. And when we, if we get these five in, then I'll give you a list of why it is tough and it's going to continue to be tough. But let's at least get the five things you got to know in first, okay? First one is this. Disagreeing with transgenderism does not mean that you're denying the pain of gender dysphoria. And so what I'm saying is, we, as a follower, you may disagree with it. But you're not denying the pain is real. Those are two different things. I may disagree with what you struggle with, but I'm not going to deny the fact that you're struggling. I'm not going to deny that there's no pain. I'm not going to, I'm not going to refuse to validate the fact that, okay, this is a real struggle. And you have to remember that that's your role. Your role, I mean, none of you in this room possess the ability to fix what's wrong with anybody else in the world. You know that, right? Ask any wife who's tried to fix her husband. Ain't happening. Right? Any husband is going to fix your wife. They never would try that. You, know, you don't have that ability. You can't fix anyone. You can't fix your kids. You can't fix your neighbor. You can't fix your boss. You can't fix anyone. You simply have to love them. And it's the end of the story. And so there's an enormous difference between the political aspects and the media aspects and this culture war that surrounds transgenderism and the precious people who have some real issues that they're dealing with. And it's heartbreaking, by the way. <coughs> if you've ever sat down with someone and really had that kind of conversation, I have yet to have it where I don't walk away feeling incredibly sad for them. And as much as they want to, as much as they want to prod and try to, try to uh, engage and get into a battle, uh, I refuse to get into this battle and arguing with them about what they've decided to do or not do. I pity them, feel bad for them, uh, because it's got to be heartbreaking to be them. It's got to be heartbreaking to be in their skin. Uh, I remember talking to a guy who is dressing like a girl, but he really is still a guy. And I said, man, it's got to be awful to be you. Well, no, I like me. I said, well, that's great. I like you too. But it's just got to be awful to be you. Because at the end of the day, when this conversation is over with, I knew you before. And I loved you before. I still love you now. This has got to be awful to be you. So you just break my heart. So I hurt for you. And they got mad. They told me, I don't want you to hurt for me. I said, well, what do you want from me? I want you to accept me. I said, I do accept you. I accept you as someone I just feel sorry for. And I really hurt for you. That's all you're going to get from me. No fight. I'm not going to hit you with my Bible. I'm not going to quote King James to you. I'm not going to tell you wrong because you already know I think you're wrong. And you know why I think you're wrong. I just feel for you. They said they don't want to talk to me anymore. And that's okay. That, that, really, that is okay. Because at the end of the day, I can't fix that. And so we have to understand that we ground our convictions in God's unchanging, perfect word. And we have to learn to speak with compassion as we deal with those that struggle with this. Okay? Second, to remember... A man cannot become a woman, and a woman cannot become a man. I mean, <laughs> the biggest claim of the transgender movement is that a man who thinks he's a woman can really be a woman and vice versa. And that includes Caitlyn Jenner. I mean, I, 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 at the end of the day, Caitlyn Jenner still has a gold medal from the Olympics in Montreal. Caitlyn Jenner may be one of the greatest athletes to ever live. 
And it doesn't matter what Caitlyn Jenner does. Caitlyn Jenner can be Caitlyn Jenner, but at the end of the day, Caitlyn still was the Olympic world record holder in the men's decathlon. I'm not convinced that Caitlyn couldn't be the world record holder in the women's decathlon now, if the Olympic Committee keeps doing what they're doing. But one of the greatest male athletes in the history of the world now identifies as a woman. You can change a lot of things, but you can't change the person's biological makeup. The psychology of the mind cannot override the facts of a person's biological markers. And we are just now on the crest of, and this is going to happen over the next 10 years, we're just now on the crest of those first studies that have come out of all the psychological damage that's going to have to be fixed and undone and unraveled because of the acceptance of this movement. And we're already seeing the first results, which is a whole different topic of now the reversals to go back to what you originally were before, which is a mess and a half. The third thing you need to know is the Bible supplies the framework for understanding the transgender revolution. We've talked about that a little bit in worship. I mean, again, we get back to that. How were you created? How were you made? How were you born? What, what do you believe about creation? Um, and so in this created but broken world, we understand that there is a creator, there is a creation, there is a way that he has made you, and he said it was very good. The Bible really does speak to this. You know, people will argue the Bible doesn't say anything about it. It does. Um, fourth, the trans transgender debate questions. The transgender debate will question now whether men and women and moms and dads are actually real. Because you do realize this is undercuts the roles of the family, the models of the family. Who does what? Where do you draw your identity? Um, and if being a man or a woman is determined by someone's mind or will, it means there's no longer such a thing as being a real male or a real female. You can just be whatever you want to be. Um, and you can do it on cultural stereotypes. You can do it on anything that's going around and you begin to erase the biological significance of maleness and femaleness, and it destroys the script that God has written about your life and my life that he has put out from the beginning of time when he knit us together in our mother's womb. All of that falls into play here. Um, but as I said, this is a great tool of Satan because what it does is it undercuts the family. It undercuts the way that we look at our roles. It undercuts the identity that we find in our sexuality. And God is a creator of sex. He is the creator of male and female. He did it on purpose, the way that he did it. And so that really is something um, that I think gets lost in this whole, well, you know, I don't want to cause any trouble. No, no, no. If you, if you just give everybody a pass, what you're doing is now you're undercutting what is the destruction of the family and the roles in family and how we raise kids. Uh, fifth, Christians have to have both conviction and compassion because this is a loaded issue that doesn't go away. So we need to know what the Bible says. We need to know what we believe and why we believe it. We need to be secure in that. But we also need to be able to speak with compassion and a hurting heart for those that are going with it. You can tolerate anybody. You don't have to bless what they do. And we're very tolerant in our culture of a lot of different things. And I can be tolerant of you, and I can be tolerant of you making bonehead choices, and you can hopefully be tolerant of my bonehead choices. But you never have to accept my bonehead choices, especially if they're sinful. Nor do I have to accept yours. Tolerance, we're good at. We live all our lives being tolerant. And if you ever demand that someone be more than tolerant, of you, get over yourself. Because no one owes you that they're going to like you. No one's going to have to agree with everything you like. Because we're all wired different, right? I even got an email from somebody making fun of me for uh, criticizing the Alabama hat that was on the elephant Sunday. 
I mean, they got, you know, if we're, and we're just going back and forth. Someone wanted to say, was someone really emailing you about that, texting you about that hat on the elephant? No, I was making that up. I was just doing that because Richard changed the hat at 11.15, and he took the Kentucky hat off and put the Alabama hat on. So I was just making my text up as I was walking up there to harass him. It wasn't real. Um, but some Alabama fan out there, because, you know, Alabama fans are weird. They, uh, they just did what they had to do. Um, but we are, um, we are in a culture that is building a society apart from religion right now. This is a post-Christian world. And so the fact that we have taken religion, we've taken God out of the culture, and we're, throwing, and we're overthrowing that Judeo-Christian model, that means we're throwing family out with that. We're throwing our, our role models, we're throwing our sexuality. We're throwing all of that out. And by untethering sex from marriage, what we have done is we have enabled the normalization of hardcore pornography, the explosive growth of sexually transmitted diseases, the death of over 60 million babies in the womb. We can do all of that when you take the Judeo-Christian principles out of our culture. Everything is okay because there are no boundaries anymore. Um, let me tell you what's driving it. You know, and then this, this will be quick, okay? Um, why do you keep hearing about this? Well, there is a very wealthy and powerful LGBTQ movement out there. There are activists. There are groups. The human rights campaign alone, sometimes referred to as big gay, brings in approximately $70 million each year and pays out millions and millions of dollars in salaries and spends bukus of money on lobbying Congress for laws and rules and changes to culture as we know it. Happens all the time. Um, that is going on even as we speak. There also are some wealthy and powerful professional groups like the American Psychiatric Association and the American Psychological Association who ceased using science as a foundation of their mental health diagnosis when they began caving into pressure from homosexual activists 45 years ago. In 73, when gay activists began attacking the meetings of the APA committee that decides what disorders appear in their official diagnostic and statistical manual mental health disorders, it was in that year that the attacks continued until committee members relented and they no longer listed homosexuality as a mental disorder. That came as a result of activists lobbying this group. And so, now, from 1973 until today, the American Psychiatric Association and American Psychological Association has now embraced something that did not hold up in science and continued to perpetuate it. For example, Pure Passion Media attempted to interview therapists for a new document documentary that was called Transformed, Finding Peace with Your God-Given Gender. And they could not find one of the members of the American Psychiatric Association and the American Psychological Association to appear on camera to talk about the dangers of promoting transgenderism for fear that they would lose their accreditation and their jobs. So that says there are some very powerful and influential associations out there that have also done some of the heavy lifting to bring this into the mainstream. The media. <laughs> We don't really need to explain this. But Ephesians 2.2 2 tells us that Satan is the prince of the power of the air. Do you think when the Bible was written that Paul, when he wrote that letter to Ephesians, ever could have imagined the impact of that phrase? That Satan is the prince of the power of the air? Because right now, with one click of an input button, I can bring up Netflix, and I can show and pick out a number of things that would make most of us in this room embarrassed to watch it with each other in this room. Doesn't mean you're not watching it at home. I got that. But it would be embarrassed to watch it together. I got it. I understand. Why? Because you can access anything. I had a teenage boy and his dad sitting in my office not too long ago having a discussion about pornography. And I looked at the young man who was having a, a real struggle with this. It's, it's going to change the way that he does relationships. And I said, look, 
I said, I got news for you. I said, you know, I said, I, it, will, it will shock you to know that, you know, your pastor um, read or saw other books beside the Bible growing up. I said, there was a magazine when I was a kid called Playboy. First time I ever saw that, it was because my friend, who was my age, stole it from his older brother and brought it to school, and we looked at it. I had no idea what I was looking at. That was pornography. I said, now you can walk to any office. You can look at your phone. You can do a Google search or a Yahoo search, and you can see more on your phone in your hand than I ever could have seen over the course of my life to your age. It is that easy. It is that accessible. And there's nothing that anybody can do to block that out, to filter that out, to stop you from seeing it. I said, that's how accessible it is for you now. I said, because it's coming literally through the air. And you can see the image. Ephesians 2, 2. Satan is the prince of the power of the air. TV, streaming media, this is going to continue to be reinforced. It's not going to stop. Uh, fourth, um, there is uh, a lot of churches. Sadly, the Christian community is starting to embrace it. And so there are going to be some churches out there. There are going to be some pastors out there. If you pay a lot of attention, you listen real close, you begin to hear the chinks in the armor, and you begin to discover, whoa, wait a minute. There's a mega church in this area. The clip has circled around, and people have seen it, and they've gone, I can't believe they said that. It was about, it was Paul, it was about, I think the, the, the intent was to be, to make the statement of how accepting they were. But in attempting to explain that, the guy stumbled all over himself and said some things that there's just no way that you can really believe, or so you would think when you see the clip, until the following week when they doubled down on it. That's one of the larger churches in Central Florida right now, and the ripple effect of that will continue for the next 20 years in that church. I can promise you that. Um, and uh, the last part is, I mean, it, it's us. I mean, we're, we, we, we have a voice in this world. And so we start using our voice, and until we start doing those things that we know we need to do uh, by, by voting and, and by paying attention and by speaking into and, and, and learning to love and learning to love in the right ways and, and, and learning to speak the truth in love, until we learn to do that, we're going to always find ourselves trying to catch up. Now, we're out of time. So let's pray and be done. God, thank you. Help us to be salt and light in a world that needs it. Amen. All right, get out.